Hello YouTube, Bane666 here. So I want to continue with my exploration of the second wave feminists because a lot of people, even anti-feminists, excuse them and say, well, it's the third wave we should be worried about. The second wave was just about equality and women's rights and, and it's what feminism has become which is the issue. And that's not true. Uh, feminism has always been anti-male. And that has always been its primary concern. And you'll see this today with further exploration of the second wave hate machine. Now, my intention for this third part in this series was going to be separatism, not an option for most women. And I will get back to that. But I did come across something even more interesting, which I thought I should cover first. And that's an article from 2003 by Louise Armstrong. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Louise Armstrong, she was a feminist who died back in 2008, and her focus was on incest and the victims of incest. And when I say victims, uh, I mean female victims exclusively. And she focused exclusively on male perpetrators. Now, this isn't a great shock to me because... She was herself a victim, and her father was the perpetrator. So she clearly turned this into a lifelong hate mission focused squarely at all men, as you will see uh, when we get into this article. Trust me, it is filled with hate. Now, when she refers to victims in this particular article, she says women and children. But it's pretty clear that when she says children, she's talking about female children exclusively. And this is easy to prove because in the same article, it says, When I first went out in the mid-1970s looking for women to share in my forum, which would become the book Kiss Daddy Goodnight, it was into a world of total silence on the issue. Women came and they called. So women adult women who were molested by their fathers when they were children. That is exclusively what she was looking for. And then she puts forward the narrative that it is exclusively men who molest their children, which are, of course are all female. And there are never fathers molesting their sons or mothers molesting their daughters or mothers molesting their sons. None of that happens or apparently it's just not important for some reason. Uh, probably because it doesn't suit the feminist narrative. So this article I found amazing. It is very angry, very biased, filled with hate, and not a lot of rationality or equality. Now, I will be responding to this article with counter-information regarding incest, but also female pedophiles. Now, I should note that, obviously, not all female pedophiles commit incest, because sometimes they rape other people's children. But it does fall under the same category of female perpetrators and how we tend to ignore them. Uh, we never speak about female perpetrators, only male perpetrators. And that's because of people like Louise Armstrong. Despite many people claiming that she's a, a saint working to, um, to get the voices of the victims of incest heard, which, in some ways, she did. In other ways, though, she, uh, she did the exact opposite. She silenced victims that didn't fit into her predetermined narrative and also acted as a shield for those victimizers that don't fit into her feminist narrative, namely female perpetrators. So, without any further delay, let's get stuck into it. The story I want to tell is the way the issue of incest which was born of the women's movement in the U.S., which is a political issue, an issue of violence toward women and children. A Waterford woman is accused of sexually assaulting the teenage son she gave up for adoption when he was a baby. Police say Amy Sword used the Internet to track down her biological son that she gave up over 10 years ago. When she found him, police say the 35-year-old mother had sex with him. She's facing one count of third-degree criminal sexual conduct. Right now, she's free on bond. An issue that belongs to feminism, was hijacked and diffused. It is the story of the way women's language has been stolen, of the way our stories have been abducted and reshaped to suit others' agendas, of the backlash that has co-opted this issue, remolded it to bring it under its control. Consider, 
what other human behavior, forever labeled a heinous crime, has routinely been converted into no more than an interpersonal dispute. My hope is that reviewing the history might galvanize the action so urgently needed to get our own back. So as we will see in a minute, her issue is that professionals have got involved, that is psychologists and psychiatrists have got involved and they're giving their opinions on incest and why it happens and they're trying to find a cure for it and she has a problem with this because in her mind it's a feminist issue and it's feminists who should be talking about it and the answer is pretty simple blame men that that's pretty much it blame men demonize men uh, shit on men as much as possible and don't worry about all that psychology stuff no don't worry about trying to find why people do it no we know why people do it it's patriarchy right and don't worry about trying to cure it and stop people from doing it in the future no no just demonize men that's much simpler it's much easier this co-optation of the issue is apparent from the outset the very first incest conference i ever attended perhaps the first incest conference there ever was, was in 1978. Even in those times when the issue of incest was so newly raised, when its feminist origins, its content of licensed violence against women and children was clear. So is there such a thing as a, a female paedophile? Oh yes. Now, female paedophiles, there's, there's a great deal of controversy about this. In fact, when I brought up the issue that women could sexually abuse children, I was vilified. I was cast out of the sisterhood. I was no longer a good feminist because sexual abuse had to be under the guise of male power. And if I had a significant number of women who were sexually abusing children and I knew about these women, then that messed up. The, the male power thing. And surely if women were going to abuse children, then they had to be doing it under the thumb of a man. A man had to be telling them to do it. Do women tend to only commit child abuse if there's a man involved as well? No, no. In over 75% of the cases, the women acted completely alone. Most times there wasn't even a man in, uh, in the premises. So, you know, the, the excuse. And it's interesting about, about us as women because we're quite willing to accept that we are a superior breed and that we do everything right, um, but quite unwilling to accept that we could do anything quite as horrible as this. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's really not us. Mine was the only voice at that conference naming men the offenders, calling for male accountability, calling for serious social change. We had a conference about this eventually in, I think, 94, maybe earlier. 400 people applied to come to this conference. It was a huge conference. But 30 people, between 20 and 30 people came, dotted themselves in the audience and tried to disrupt it. They were yelling that, you know, this, why was I paying attention to women? It wasn't women. I was taking the attention away from men. One of the women who was going to talk about her own abuse who was now helping others, then couldn't face the audience. So you had this uproar. You had people in the audience turning on these, these women who were standing up saying, sit down, we want to hear about this. And you had them shouting, and it was just, it was absolutely strange. Um, and very sad, because it was like, don't tell me this information, even if it's true, because I don't want to hear it. And if those women who came along to our conference had had anything to do about it, nobody else would have ever talked about it. It would have just gone away. Otherwise, it was various professionals who spoke there, all moving in on this issue and trying to bring it under the domain of their expertise. Social work professionals spoke about why incest should be decriminalized and brought under their dominion. Psychologists spoke about incest as a symptom of family dysfunction, to be treated under their dominion. And then a Swedish professor spoke. There was, he said, no incest in Sweden. However, he said, he was there because social problems in the US tended to turn up sooner or later in Sweden. And I smiled and raised my hand, then, to express awe at the idea that incest was an American export item. 
Okay, I have to question how accurate her reporting of this conference actually was. I think she might be just a little bit biased. Uh, I don't know if social workers were trying to decriminalise incest. I find that hard to believe uh, that was happening back in the late 70s. But, you know, I'm happy to stand corrected if I'm wrong. As for there being no incest in Sweden... Yeah, I, I call bullshit on that one. I don't think incest is an American thing. I seriously think it's a generational thing. I think someone who has been abused as a child is more likely to grow up and be an abuser. Now, that's not saying that everyone who is abused as a child will grow up and be an abuser. Some people will deal with that and move on with their lives. Others will spend their entire lives uh, on a hate mission towards men, like this particular feminist, and a small percentage will grow up and then abuse their children or other people's children and continue the cycle. Uh, that's what we should be talking about here. Instead of making it a feminist issue, instead of making it men bad, women victims, we should be talking about the cycle and the psychological reasons why a small percentage of people do this, as well as getting help for those who have been molested, not only because that's the right thing to do, but because it might break the cycle. You know, or we could just say all men are shit, uh, you know, take your pick. I thought, at the time, I was being funny. No trace of feminist analysis over 20 years later, friends. Incest is an American export item and what is being exported bears no trace of feminist analysis. Well, that's a good thing then, although I would argue that's not completely accurate. I think feminism and feminists like this particular one have had a fairly significant influence on how we talk about incest and pedophilia. That is why the female abuser is almost never talked about and never heard of. Or never researched. Many people have been shocked at the fact that two women were at the centre of this horrific case of abuse. Our home editor Mark Easton explains the scale of sexual abuse of children by women. The facts of this case challenge our understanding of human nature, not just the idea that people could find pleasure in the sexual abuse of very young children, but the revelation that women were involved. However, experts claim this kind of behaviour is not as uncommon as many suppose. A quarter of sexually abused children were the victim of a female, according to separate American and British studies. Although estimates vary, that would suggest a quarter of a million people in Britain today suffered sex abuse perpetrated by a woman. And yet such allegations are often disbelieved, and there are few prosecutions. In 2007, only six women in England and Wales were convicted of sex abuse crimes against children. Women abuse children for the same reasons that men abuse children, for sexual gratification, for power. Quite frankly, it's something that they enjoy doing. I know that's hard for the rest of us to comprehend, but women are no different than men in that case. A few weeks ago in Australia, a new TV campaign was launched warning of the risks of sex abuse from those entrusted with the care of children. Then they went to the school we thought was a safe place where a trusted person sexually assaulted Emma and Katie, silenced them with threats and changed their lives forever. The charity involved has calculated that almost a third of sex abuse by women takes place in an organisational setting, notably kindergartens and babysitting. The majority of such abusers are not coerced by a man, but initiate the abuse themselves. The damage can last a lifetime. It is professionals, experts, from the U.S. who travel the world putting forth the American model of response to the issue, the American interpretation of it, the American way of containing and managing it. They stage conferences, attend conferences, are invited in as consultants by governments. What they are selling is not feminist. In the U.S. it has not been good for women nor children. The smiling face of Vanessa George. This is how she was known to her family, and to the families at the nursery where she worked. But behind their backs, she was sexually abusing young children and taking photos of that abuse. Today, she was the one being photographed, but unlike her victims, she could turn away. 
if you could think of your average big bubbly woman, that was what she was like. Friendly, funny, lovely. This mother had no idea. She trusted Vanessa George to look after her children. We have disguised her identity. There's no evidence her youngsters were among those abused by George here at the Little Ted's nursery in Plymouth, but she says the whole community has been left shattered. The worst feeling you could ever imagine. Feeling sick 24 hours a day, not being able to sleep, drinking during the day, and just going to, to pick children up at the school and having mums and dads in tears and all having to hug each other. Vanessa George had been working with children for a decade. She had passed all the required checks. She was married with two teenage daughters. But secretly, she was a paedophile, sexually abusing babies and toddlers, taking photographs of that abuse on her mobile phone and sending the images to others. Some of the pictures categorised by police as being the worst level of child pornography. Today, with her hair back to its natural blonde, George stared at the floor as the court heard that none of the children in her images can be identified. So for parents, some of whom were sobbing in the public gallery, the agony goes on. Every time I look at the kids, I just wonder, did she abuse them? My husband won't talk about it, but sometimes I see him sitting there crying. I know what he's thinking. It's horrendous. Vanessa George was urged by the judge to end the parents' uncertainty and identify her victims. Her motivation for not telling us at this time, we don't know. Obviously, the judge is quite clear that, in his opinion, the families will want to know. Um, and it is one of our priorities to continue, even beyond this conviction today, to try and identify those children. For Vanessa George's estranged father, it is still too much to take in. I was so often, I think, why did she turn this way? motivated her. It's just like as if Vanessa's lost her way. She's doing this obviously because for money. There's no other reason why she should behave like she asked them. But the police don't think it was about money. They believe Vanessa George was motivated purely by sexual gratification. She'd met two other people on the internet and today they met face to face for the very first time in the dock at Bristol Crown Court. The first was this man, Colin Blanchard, a businessman from Rochdale. He was arrested after a colleague found extreme images on his computer. He'd been on the sex offenders register before. After examining his emails, the police were led to Vanessa George in Plymouth and then to another woman, Angela Allen in Nottingham. She was also 39, single, unemployed, and described by one detective as pure evil. Single mother Angela Allen contributed a series of explicit pictures showing her abusing a three-year-old girl. I just feel disgusted. I just can't believe that somebody has been on the doorstep, especially a woman, and that it doesn't make any difference whether it's a man or a woman, but I think the general reaction, the fact that it's a woman, has made, made it worse. I don't even think it was a gender issue. I think everybody felt helpless. Everybody. The police believe they were equal parties, all abusing children and sending thousands of obscene messages to one another and to nobody else. It's the scale of their deceit, the way that they've manipulated relationships and the cunning that they've all used for their own ends is really, really shocking. Child abuse in its most horrific and devilish form. It is a model that depends on manipulation, diversion and distraction one that seeks problem management, rather than problem elimination. In the US, the primary manipulation of this feminist issue involved co-opting it and converting it from a political issue into one of pathology. This model says that incest is a disease form, it is an illness, and the illness lies in the victims. This model puts forth incest, not as male violence, but as entirely gender neutral. Sexual abuse by women as the same foundation as that committed by men. They've generally experienced childhood abuse themselves. Women are not immune from turning into abusers, as we like to think. By pretending that female paedophiles don't exist, we have little protection from them. Yeah, w women who sexually abuse children like to have jobs where they're around children. Um, nursing, teaching, uh, daycare, 
things like that. You really don't think twice. I mean, most parents don't think twice about leaving their children in care of a woman. They do now think twice about leaving their child in care of a man. Again, I think that that's wrong. But there you are. That's that's what's happening. So they they will find jobs where they can get. It's 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 like an alcoholic in a bar. Yeah. If if you can possibly, if you've got an addiction, and this is an addiction, then you will go to some place that you can actually practice your addiction. And any place around kids is a good place. Not only are offenders not identified as male, but the idea of an offense does not enter the picture. This is a model of medical manipulation, and it is under the domain of professionals, of experts, who dismiss feminist analysis as biased, political, unprofessional. Yes, uh, that would be because it is biased, political and unprofessional, and that's why it should be ignored. The entire purpose of feminists like this is to demonize men. If it wasn't, if she was actually concerned about victims of sexual abuse, children who have been sexually abused by a parent, then she would be talking about all victims and all perpetrators. Instead, she's only focusing on a select number of victims of a select number of perpetrators. She's not even talking about female victims of female perpetrators. Apparently they're unimportant. Apparently they don't matter. It only matters when a man does it, because that's her motivation, demonizing men. This essentially is revenge against her father. And I can understand her wanting revenge against her father. I can understand any victim of molestation wanting revenge against their molester. That's perfectly reasonable. It's perfectly understandable. But to take that out on all men and to silence victims while you do it, and to act as a shield to a certain type of perpetrator, that's unacceptable. That makes you a fucking scumbag, not a hero. Now, earlier in this video, you heard some statistics from a news report. It basically said that one quarter of pedophiles are in fact female, and it quoted two different reports, one from America and one from the UK. Now, I'm going to tell you that the number is probably a lot higher than that, and there's a reason. This is from an article talking about female sexual abusers, uh, which I'll get to next month. Trust me, it's a very, very interesting article. But for now, just let me read you this one little bit. It says, Tellingly, researchers have found that victims who experience childhood sexual abuse at the hands of both women and men are more reluctant to disclose the victimization perpetrated by women. Indeed, the discomfort of reporting child sexual victimization by a female perpetrator can be so acute that a victim may instead inaccurately report that his or her abuser was male. Let that sink in for a second. So, victims of female pedophiles are more likely to say that the victimizer was male. And one of the reasons for this is because it's more acceptable. They're more likely to be believed. If they say that the victimizer was a female or their mother, it's more likely to be dismissed. So they either convince themselves that it was a male or alternatively, they lie and say it was a male so they can at least talk about what happened to them. So, yeah, one quarter, I think, may be a little understated. I also want to read you a few statistics from a paper done by Michelle Elliott, and you saw her earlier in some of the clips. I actually want to do another video on this paper because it's very, very interesting, and I don't have time to go through the whole thing now, so that will be an extra video in the future. Trust me, it will be worth the wait. But she talks about how she went on radio talking about the possibility of female perpetrators, and she was overwhelmed with responses. And it says here, 65% of the survivors who tried to tell a therapist, doctor, teacher, or other professional were not believed the first time they disclosed. Overall, 86% of those who tried to tell anyone were not believed the first time they disclosed. So that is a real problem. How are we going to have an accurate picture of how many female perpetrators there really are if we don't listen to them, if we ignore them, if we say, no, that didn't happen, if we call them liars, if, they, if we say they must be mistaken? How are we going to get accurate numbers? It also says here, 
what do we know? How many of the victims of female sexual abuse are boys? How many are girls? Of the 127 cases discussed here, approximately 33% were boys, 67% were women. 67%. That's a high number. You would think that feminists, being advocates for female issues, would actually want to discuss that, right? Because they're meant to be advocating for females. They're meant to be defending female victims. But surprisingly, these women aren't important because the perpetrator's female. And you can't demonize a male perpetrator if you're talking about female perpetrators, right? So yeah, yeah, this whole thing is political. And the whole motivation is shitting on men. It's not about victimhood. It's not about giving a voice to those who are victims. In fact, they silence many, many victims. Where, in the feminist analysis, the women who as children were raped by fathers were the authorities on what had happened to them and what it had meant, to the medicalizers, the victims are objects, not equals, to be clinically evaluated in terms of symptoms and disorders, and labeled and treated. The medical model does not seek offender accountability or raise the vision of an end to this violence. It functionally supports the status quo. The medical model does not seek offender accountability or raise the vision of an end to this violence. It functionally supports the status quo. And ironically, that is exactly what she is doing towards female offenders and the victims of those female offenders. They don't count. They're not important. We'll never discuss them because it's not a means of demonizing men. That is her one goal. Taking revenge on her father by demonizing all men. This was a lifelong hate mission. And in doing so, she silenced victims and acted as a shield to pedophiles. What a fucking scumbag. And of course, this article appears on the Vancouver rape relief and women's shelter website a place which is meant to be anti-rape which is meant to stop rape but instead promotes articles like this and promotes feminists like this one who instead silence victims and act as a shield for pedophiles wouldn't that fall under the feminist definition of rape culture wouldn't that make them rape apologists how many victims haven't been believed because of people like this how many victims have been silenced? How many victims have committed suicide? And how many perpetrators have continued to go on and victimize other people, other children? It's people like this who are largely responsible for that. They wrote, From sharing the personal, we identified the political. From listening, we found the commonalities in our stories and, through listening to one another, we also were able to hear what the offenders said. It was quite clear then, that what we were talking about was a historically licensed abuse of power. A historically licensed abuse of power. So what she's talking about here is patriarchy theory. The notion that men have always dominated and controlled women, and women are the oppressed class, and men think they can do whatever they want. They have the right to do whatever they want, apparently which includes raping women and little girls. Uh, now, that makes me wonder, why do female pedophiles do it? Is that because of matriarchy? It was crystal clear to us, men did not do this in spite of the fact that they know it is wrong. Those men who choose to do it do so because they believe it is their right, or at least justifiable. You know what she says here, those men who choose to do it. I, I hate to tell you this, but... Pedophiles don't choose to become pedophiles, okay? It's a mental illness. They don't have any control over their actions. It's a compulsion. No one wakes up one morning and thinks, you know, uh, may maybe I want to be attracted to three-year-olds. Now, I, I don't want to come across as justifying or excusing their behavior in any way. Uh, I, I think they're sick and they absolutely disgust me. That's both male and female pedophiles, just for the record. But I do acknowledge that it is a mental illness. It's not something someone chooses to do or to be. But it's pretty clear here what she's saying is that, you know, men control the world because we live in a patriarchy and 
you know, one day a man thinks, maybe I'll just abuse my daughter because uh, why not, you know? There's no mental illness, there's no psychological reasons, it's got nothing to do with him being abused as a child himself and repeating that cycle. No, no, nothing to do with that. You know, it's just a man choosing to do it because men are evil, right? Yeah. Over and over, fathers were reported to say, it's natural, it's perfectly natural in nature. And uh, what did the mothers say to their victims? Oh, that's right, you didn't ask them, did you? That's convenient, isn't it? Indeed, this was what the offenders would later publicly say. One father on national TV said, You have to understand. At the time I thought I was doing her a favor. We also knew from listening that for many, many offenders, the sexual assault of the child was really a way of harming the wife, the woman. Oh, I see. Supposedly the reason why many men assault their daughters is to actually hurt their wives. Yeah, yeah. Um, i, I got to say, this feminist take on incest and pedophilia, uh, much better than the psychological one, right? I mean, it's so much simpler. You don't need to go to university and study psychology for years. No, you just assume all men are evil, and that's it. Pretty simple, straightforward, anyone can do it. One man said on TV, I'd get mad at my wife. I'd say to hell with her. I can always turn to my daughter. And so you see, talking about incest as a form of male violence against women is not hyperbole. Oh, definitely not hyperbole. I mean, all she's done is cherry pick cases, right? She's exclusively looked at male abusers and female victims and then concluded that it's because men are bad and females are victims yeah yeah i mean you know definitely not cherry picking information uh definitely not acting as a shield for female pedophiles and definitely not deleting their victims including the female ones no no of course not it's uh, a, a very well researched understanding of the issue you know clearly all men are evil when we first spoke out there was much mock horror, much outcry about dread taboos and last taboos, a most ridiculous amount of melodrama over the quote-unquote discovery of this routine, mindless, repetitive bully behavior, this presumed prerogative to child rape, which had been going on for centuries and had affected billions of women. Billions of women? Okay. Uh, but, but no male victims ever. Oh, no, actually, actually, the male victims do exist, but they just don't count, right? They're just not important. Better off just to pretend they don't exist. Just like the female victims of female pedophiles. Just pretend they don't exist because it doesn't support the feminist narrative. We tried to explain that this was first cousin to battering, in its historical roots and in the fact that it had as much to do with punishing mothers by breaking that relationship with a child as it had to do with children, or with sex with children. Oh, I see. The reason why pedophiles do it is to punish the mother, right? It's not because they have uncontrollable desires for children. It's not because of psychological issues. No, 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 no. They just want to, they just want to hurt the mother. And it's, uh, you know, patriarchy and male entitlement all the way, obviously. We are not talking about men sexually obsessed with children here. Um, actually, that is what we're talking about. That's exactly what a pedophile is. Only, obviously, not just men. We said, although there are those. We are not talking about sexual deviance, although there are those as well. We are not even talking about social deviance. We are talking about so-called normal fathers in so-called traditional families. We're talking about so-called normal fathers in so-called traditional families. Yeah, uh, we're not though, are we? Your so-called normal father is not a pedophile. It is not a typical thing that a father does. It is abnormal behavior. It is deviant behavior. And it is no more normal behavior for fathers than it is for mothers, right? But what she's trying to do here is to say that, you know, this is typical male behavior. This is what fathers do. It's not a psychological issue. 
there aren't reasons behind it other than patriarchy and male dominance. This is feminist fucking bullshit. We are, and we knew this would be the hard part, only talking about only men who only sexually assault their own children. It is that only we knew would be the hard part, the same only that we faced with wife battering, it is only his wife. Ah yes, wife battering, or should I say domestic violence, uh, which feminists also gendered, deleting male victims and female perpetrators, as well as female victims of female perpetrators. There seems to be a bit of a pattern here. How strange, these people supposedly working for victims and working for equality, how they just delete certain victims and certain perpetrators because it doesn't fit into their model of the world. Yeah, how strange. Because this bully behavior, the turning of adult male sexual power against a three-year-old, a five-year-old, was so grotesque. Women tend to use objects, uh, broom handles, bottles. One woman said that, that uh, she was sexually abused by rose stems with the thorns still on being stuck up. Um, women can be quite cruel using objects, but they're still after their own sexual gratification. So it's kind of, you know, that it, it's just actually, it's, it, it's just a physiological thing, the difference. We thought, we hoped, we believed that in breaking the silence we could get a consensus that this stuff was seriously wrong that we could get society to seriously say no more. That we could, then, begin to reduce the incidents. Okay, if that was the case, if your goal was to help victims and to reduce incidences, then why would you exclude certain victims that don't fit your narrative? Why would you exclude certain victimizers that don't fit your narrative? Well, the answer is simple. This has absolutely nothing to do with helping victims and everything to do with shitting on men and hating men and demonizing men. As I said earlier, this woman went on a lifelong revenge quest against her father. And I can understand why she would want to. But she targeted all men and blamed us for the actions of one individual man. Now, it's pretty clear from the article that I just went through with you, and, and for the record, I didn't go through the whole thing because it's quite long. Maybe I'll do another video in the future and do the rest of it. Who knows? But from what we looked at, I think it's pretty clear she's only interested in female children who have been molested by their male fathers. And she's really not interested in young male victims of either male or female pedophiles. Now, you would think a decent person would be interested in advocating for all children, including male children, but not this one, not this saint. Male children just don't count, apparently, because it doesn't fit the feminist narrative. So it's like all the boys have just been erased from history. I'm guessing most of you watching this are not the least bit surprised in that. But I want it to be as fair as possible. And just because in that particular article she doesn't talk about boys... Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that she doesn't talk about boys at some point. Maybe she wrote a book about boy survivors at some point. Maybe she wrote an article. I don't know. So I did a search. I searched Louise Armstrong boys incest. And I just got things about her having twin boys. Or Google changed the search from boys to male. Or should I say it included male in the search because apparently... There weren't many results with the uh, the term boys. So I didn't find any articles or books or anything talking about male victims. Uh, there, there was this one uh, line here that I read. It says, mainly she says, incest is a case of fathers acting out a misguided sense of male privilege. Yeah, yeah. So pedophiles are acting out male privilege. Has nothing to do with any psychological issues or, you know, uh, abuse as a child or anything like that. No, it's all male privilege. Of course it is. 
But I thought I'd expand on the search, so I did another one for Louise Armstrong, son, incest. Because I thought, you know, maybe she talks about a father molesting his son or something like that, right? Once again, I got a lot of false positives talking about her two sons. But I did come across an article from the LA Times from 1994 titled Incest, Sexual Politics or a Matter of Therapy and Recovery. I tried looking at this article, but I don't have a subscription to the LA Times. However, I did manage to find the quote concerning sons. This is what it reads. No one denies that some mothers do terrible things to their kids or that fathers can also rape sons. But Armstrong argues forcefully against making incest a gender-neutral issue since the overwhelming number of cases involve fathers and daughters. Really? Okay, let's have a look at some stats then. And uh, these stats are from Australia, by the way, but I'm pretty sure they'd be similar in the UK and the US and other Western countries. Although, you know, I'm happy to be corrected if that's not the case. So it says here that 76% of recorded sexual assault victims under the age of 15 were female and 24% male. So in other words, one quarter male. Now I would argue that one quarter male is enough to include male children in the discussion of victims. Apparently not. Apparently uh, we can't talk about that the one quarter of children being molested because they don't fit the feminist narrative. But I'd also argue that it's much, much higher than 24%. It says later in the report, importantly, there is increasing research evidence that the disclosure rates of sexual abuse by boys and men are lower than those of girls and women. It then goes on to say that one study found that 53% of male respondents did not report their abuse compared to 37% of women prior to the study. Another study from 1994 found that 61% of adult women had told someone as a child compared to 31% of men. And yet another study from 2008 showed that 64% of women are more likely to report it compared to 26% of men. So study after study shows that men and boys are far less likely to report it and far less likely to tell someone and i would argue this is largely due to feminists like louise armstrong now i'm not going to blame just louise armstrong or just feminists it's also a prevailing cultural thing where we are more willing to listen to female victims and ignore uh, male victims even if they're boys but the Louise Armstrongs of the world definitely haven't helped that. They're essentially made it worse. Now, the other interesting thing about this report is it says that when it comes to penetrative abuse, which is the most severe form of child abuse, it's 4 to 8% for males and 7 to 12% for females. So those numbers are fairly close for the most severe forms of child molestation. But when it comes to non-penetrative abuse, it's 12 to 16% for males and 23 to 36% for females. Now, obviously, non-penetrative abuse is still bad, but it is the lesser of the two evils. And although we can conclude there are, in fact, more female victims, according to the statistics available, that is also largely due to females being more likely to be victims of less severe forms of abuse. Once again, I'm not excusing that in any way, but obviously the most severe forms of abuse being penetrative statistically is a lot closer. So I think erasing male victims is fucking disgusting. Hände, woher sie kommen, wohin sie gehen. 